Good afternoon, everybody. If I can ask you to take your seats. Good afternoon, my name is Nancy Lindborg. I'm the president here at the U.S. Institute of Peace, and I'm delighted to welcome everybody here for a very special address. If you are tuning in online, you can join the conversation on Twitter with the hashtag Twardera USIP, which you can see on the screen behind me. Um, we're very honored to have with us this afternoon the President of the Central African Republic, President Faustin Arkan Tuadero. Um, the President was last here at USIP in 2016. Uh, Mr. President, welcome back to the Institute. We're delighted to have you here. Um, I al also, uh, uh, we commend him uh, for coming today. I'd like to expend, uh, extend a special welcome as well to President Tordera's delegation, um, including Monsieur Félix Malois, who's the Minister of Economy, Planning, and International Cooperation, Monsieur Henri-Marie Dondra, who's the Minister of Finance and Budget, um, Madame Marie Noel Cognara, who's the Minister of National Defense. Welcome. Uh, we're delighted to host you again. Uh, Madame Sylvie Baipo uh, Temon, who's the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Central Africans Abroad. And Monsieur Ambassador uh, Marshal uh, Dubu, who's the Ambassador of the Central African Republic to the United States. Welcome to all of the delegation. Um, I'd like to also give a special welcome to the U.S. Ambassador to Central Africa Republic, Lucy Tamlin. Uh, delighted to have you there and here with us today. Um, when you walked into the lobby today, I hope you had a chance to see the quote on the wall uh, from Eleanor Roosevelt that reads, it isn't enough to talk about peace, you have to believe in it. And it isn't enough to believe in it, you have to work at it. This is very much the foundational idea of the U.S. Institute of Peace. We were founded by Congress in 1984 uh, as an independent, nonpartisan national institute dedicated to preventing and resolving international conflicts. And we do this by linking research with policy recommendations, training and education, and working with partners who are themselves seeking to prevent and resolve violent conflict on the front lines where it exists. And one of the places that we do this is in Central Africa Republic. Um, USIP has been involved with Central Africa Republic for more than three years. Um, one of the things we've done is to hold community dialogues on security issues in, in, in a way that helps citizens speak to their government on what their concerns are. And in fact, when I visited CAR in 2016, President Tuardera very graciously met with several members, young members of the community dialogue group who were able to express directly to him their concerns and walked away deeply inspired. So once again, I thank the President for having taken that meeting. Um, most recently, we've helped to support the economic community of Central African states' efforts to prepare for the peace negotiations and to encourage the impl implementation of the agreement, which I know everyone is eager to hear more about today. Um, in February of this year, the Carr government achieved a very important milestone by signing a peace agreement with 14 of the country's armed groups. These negotiations were conducted by the African Union and the UN, and they're the eighth attempt at a peace agreement since the current crisis began in 2012. In signing this agreement, President Tuardara and the, his government have signaled their commitment to ending the profound humanitarian crisis, the injustice and the violence that has torn this country apart, leaving 20% of their population displaced, either as refugees or internally displaced, and a humanitarian crisis with acute food insecurity. So the agreement has faced challenges since its signing, and it has been contested by some groups who are waiting to see whether the agreement delivers on its promises. President Twardara faces the dual challenge of delivering on the peace agreement 
and advancing the CAR National Recovery and Peace Building Plan, which sets out the government's priorities and its vision for partnership with the international community. And doing all of this against continuing complex conflict dynamics and a lot of regional politics. We also know the international community has the opportunity to hinder or help as CAR looks forward to a more peaceful future. Um, this has been a country that has struggled with complicated conflict for decades since its independence. And to emerge from these cycles of conflict, it will take concerted partnerships between Central Africa Republic, the government, its people, and the full array of regional and international partners. President Twardara, we have here in the room with us today many of the dedicated and most knowledgeable people about Central Africa Republic, many who have been the most vocal supporters about keeping Central African Republic on the agenda, who care deeply about peace and about the future of your country. Thank you, everybody, for joining us here today. And after President Twardar's remarks, we'll have a short conversation joined by Ambassador Tamlin and Ambassador Johnny Carson. Note cards have been passed out for you to write your questions on. We'll take your questions as well as on Twitter in the conversation. And with that, I'm very pleased to hand things over to Ambassador Tamlin, who will provide a more formal introduction of President Twardara. Um, ambassador Tamlin was sworn in as the U.S. Ambassador to the Central Africa Republic in January of this year. So she's taking her post at a very pivotal and important moment. She's a career member of the Senior Foreign Service, and she most recently, uh, prior to this post, was the Ambassador to the Republic of Benin. But she's also served in South Sudan, Portugal, Chad, France, and Iraq. So she brings a lot of experience with conflict and great knowledge of the region. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Tamlin to the stage. President Twadera, President Lindborg, members of the Washington community who have come in such great numbers today what a fantastic manifestation of the strong ties between the United States and the Central African Republic. It is my honor and privilege to introduce His Excellency, Professor Faustin Archange Twadera, President of the Central African Republic. President Twadera was born and raised in the Central African Republic, attended the University of Bangui, and earned a doctorate in mathematics in 1986 from the University of Lille, and a second doctorate in mathematics in 2004 from the University of Yaoundé. He left his post as rector of the University of Bangui to serve as prime minister for five years under President Francois Bozizé, and was elected president in 2016 in the elections following the transitional government of Madame Catherine Samba Panza. There are at least two things which I think are important to know about President Twadera. The first is that in the Central African tradition, he retains his title of professor. President Twadera is in fact famous and beloved for having continued to teach mathematics at the university during the period that he served as prime minister. Love of education and the desire to help the next generation is part of his DNA. The second thing which I think is important to know is the significance of President Wadera's election. In 2016, the Central African Republic was still reeling from the violence that had led to thousands of deaths and hundreds of thousands of displaced. Holding elections was a Herculean task. But in a country which has often been ignored and overlooked, it was shown that given an opportunity, the people will mobilize and they will vote their conscience. Car may lack for much, but one thing is clear. The people have given President Twadera a mandate to lead and a mandate to work to improve the country's future. We are very pleased to welcome him here to Washington and to underscore the warm and friendly relations between our two countries 
and our shared hopes for that better future. Thank you, and President Toadera, I'm very happy to give you the floor. Madame la présidente de l'USUP, Madame la matrice des États-Unis en République centrafricaine, Mesdames et Messieurs, en prenant la parole ce jour à l'Institut des États-Unis pour la paix, USIP, je viens parler d'un sujet que nous avons en partage et que nous chérissons ensemble. Il s'agit de la paix. Je viens donc parler, partager le rêve de paix que nourrit le peuple centrafricain dans toute sa diversité. Je suis devant vous pour porter la voix de mes compatriotes qui ont décidé d'ouvrir ensemble une nouvelle page d'une histoire de concorde. Je voudrais aussi remercier très sincèrement pour l'intérêt particulier qu'il porte à mon pays et qui se traduit davantage par cette rencontre. Mesdames et Messieurs, depuis la signature le 6 février 2019 de l'accord de paix et la réconciliation en République centrafricaine, de nouvelles perspectives se sont ouvertes. Un nouvel espoir est permis. Mon intention présente, c'est de partager avec vous ma vision pour la paix en République centrafricaine en rappelant d'où nous venons, en montrant où nous sommes aujourd'hui et en esquissant quelques points. In the Central African Republic, we are coming out of a long, painful crisis uh, whose duration and the damages incurred are awful. Since 2012, uh, there has been incredible violence without precedent, uh, fed by slogans, fed by hate and exclusion and this seriously undermined social cohesion, imperiled the unity of the country, and threatened the foundations of the state. At a certain point, my country became a cliché of hate. Uh, that would be almost predictable between Christians and Muslims. That is an erroneous way to look at the situation as lived by the Central Africans. Uh, we fought, uh, we talked about this during the National Forum in May 2015. In starting my uh, term of office, uh, I made an oath to my people in the face of the vast challenges and the emergency of the national situation. I swore to emphasize foundational actions for reconstruction. So I announced that I would spend all my energy to win the wager of peace and security, to reconcile my people through justice and truth, in order to be able to sustainably uh, launch a plan for the recovery of society and the economy. The, peace, the path to peace went through dialogue between um, the CAR and the 14 armed groups in the country. It is in this framework uh, that this African initiative for peace and reconciliation saw the light uh, under the aegis of the African Union by ensuring the, that 
basic principles were observed, uh, these being the respect of the Constitution of 2016, the com respect for the legitimate elections of 2015 and 2016, and the preservation of the territorial integrity of the Central African Republic. Several meetings took place uh, with the armed groups and with social and political actors to pave the way towards the dialogue that was held in Khartoum. The discussions uh, involved everything that affected the crisis without any taboos. And the compromise that were obtained that, was, that seemed fair gave to my fellow citizens the, this political agreement for peace and reconciliation, and this agreement was signed on February 6, 2019. It is the true manifestation of this common will to turn the page on this bloody history. Um, it shows that this process uh, would not have been such a great success if all the partners of the Central African Republic, and including the United States and organizations such as USIP, uh, which played a discrete role, but very important role. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are at the stage of implementation for this agreement. Uh, it was strengthened by the last compromise that was agreed on uh, on March 19, 18th, uh, 2019 in Addis Ababa. Um, we have this agreement, which is a powerful tool. Each of the words within it were the subject of a compromise uh, of by the parties. It is a true jewel that will reform the social fabric that was very much undermined by discriminations of various types. Exclusion, uh, taking advantage of the crisis, the culture of impunity, um, and poor gestion of the public finances. For this jewel, we must keep in mind that the success of the ag agreement requires from all parties efforts to strengthen the relations of trust among them to allow us to surmount all obstacles. More than ever, I am determined to mobilize my fellow citizens from all walks of life so that this agreement um, created together be implemented together. And aware that the dialogue of Khartoum, uh, so that it's not just one more dialogue, the parties took one more commitment, and it was detailed in the two appendices. Th they took on 21 commitments. The government uh, showed its determination to improve the conditions for the consolation of peace. The armed groups um, took on 10 commitments uh, to show their adherence to the peace process, the recognition of the urgency of stopping uh, the hostilities uh, against civilians, uh, the respect of constitutional order, the respect of elected institutions and territorial integrity. Um, in accordance with the agreement, everything will be done um, to resolve these conflicts and to give greater place to the strength of arguments, but not to let the argument of force proper, prosper. We must end these reprehensible behaviors, uh, these socially in inadmissible behaviors uh, that have contributed to the weakening of the state. The objective of peace in my country requires that we invest in the consolidation of the democratic culture, um, make a change to political practices so that violence is no longer a shortcut to getting a political role in the republic. In a sense, uh, actions will be led, such as revising the law on political parties, um, so that they actually promote these values of peace and cohesion.
It will also be a question of working on the establishment of a law on uh, the status of a former head of state. Two, it will be impersonal, but it will ensure a decent life for former, former dignitaries. Um, and that will encourage a leaving power in decent conditions, the promotion of human rights and a peace, a culture of peace. These are major actions um, to make this, the unity of the, pay, the country real. Uh, a unity based on unity, and this will be based on um, consultations that will be peaceful, and we will have sound elections. My deep conviction is that the rules of good governance that come out of a harmonious political consensus will create a, an environment that secures all and reassures everyone. No, another uh, item is the DDRR national program, uh, which will help to end the violence um, among all the groups that have committed, because they will take part in this process. Uh, we want this process to be, be well led and to be efficient and functional. Uh, to support this process, uh, we will have so security sector reform, uh, and we will have optimal conditions for the reforming of the security uh, and defense forces. Some of the new elements will come from uh, the armed groups uh, after they have completed the uh, certification. Uh, the certification uh, was established by the EUTM and uh, MINUSCA. From this, with this dynamic approach to global security, the agreement has made it possible to move forward um, by <coughs> confronting basic uh, questions such as um, the migration of cattle, which has become a problem for insecurity. By managing things for this issue. We want to engage our partners, our neighboring countries, to act in a cooperative manner to manage this issue, which has security implications uh, in terms of relations between communities on the national level and also at the sub-regional level. The agreement uh, made a first step towards a solution through the compromise on the establishment of uh, mixed security units, joint security units, um, to work on appeasement and improving security um, with regard to transhumans uh, uh, within the country and with neighboring countries. In looking at the crisis in Central African Republic, there has been an equitable distribution of national resources, and economic issues are very significant factors in this crisis. The result is that the agreement, if it is to be sustainable, there has to be also solutions that focus on the economic problems. If the agreement is to help us to truly rebuild our country and restore peace, then we must also focus on the goal of establishing a, a minimum vital salary or sub subsistent wages. And in many of our areas of our country, we are, we are starting urgent development uh, projects for social and infrastructure projects for basic needs. Young people need to be able to find new opportunities and perspectives with this agreement because they lack hope. Women in Central Africa Republic must feel that they play also a pivotal role in society and that this role is recognized through their empowerment projects, their economic development projects, and their contributions. Peace will be even more easy to achieve once we have been able to tackle the issues of poverty and we've been able to tackle the issues of violence that is being committed by people who are actually lacking in hope and don't have any other prospects. And because of this, we need to make sure that if people have a chance to succeed, that this is going to be a concrete step towards helping to reduce uh, the use of weapons. Ladies and gentlemen, 
The scars left by the violence that we experienced in, in CAR are very deep indeed. The numerous victims continue to suffer. They suffer greatly from this violence and they also fear that peace may be given or established in exchange for impunity. However, the 700, the 700 delegates to the National Forum in Bangui who met in May of 2015 were categorical on this and they rejected any idea of offering amnesty. If the Central African people are not able to achieve this desire for reconciliation, then they are not, they're going to also not see justice. The problem of justice and national reconciliation is, is something that plays a major role. And believe me, there will not be impunity in our country. During the Khartoum discussions, the subject of justice was uh, discussed, sometimes in a very passionate manner. And all the different facilitators of these negotiations helped us to discuss the realities and to obtain a commitment from all the protagonists and compromises that would allow us to establish this agreement that would be acceptable to all parties. But what is this compromise? First of all, the principle of fighting against impunity has been reaffirmed. And this includes everybody, because we can no longer conceive that we have peace in Central African Republic if it is based on amnesty for crimes. Second, some of the actors apparently did not really have a full understanding of the seriousness of the events and the tragedies that we experience in, in CAR. And so, uh, with an, uh, in an effort to provide more clarity and shed light on these issues, we have established an inclusive committee, commission, that will have the task of examining all the different acts and facts related to the tragic events and to discuss whatever cases could perhaps be brought to justice. This commission will have will enable us to have a better view of the situation. The Inclusive Commission will then uh, provide its report to the Truth, Justice, and Reconciliation Commission, which will use the, this report uh, to help shed light on the truth so that justice can be dealt out fairly and help to repair and heal the wounds in the hearts of our people. This is the only way that we will be able to achieve true reconciliation and that we will be able to have a constitutional ju judicial pro uh, process and to have all the different endogenous mechanisms at our disposal, such as including uh, using traditional methods and traditional authorities. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to ensure that there is where we stand today, and we have a very clear idea of where we want to go. However, we must note that we may also be limited in our efforts, especially since the government is not present in certain parts of our country. We must be able to have the strength to reassure our population, to make sure that we have monopoly on the power to protect citizens and defend our country so that only the government, that the government would be able to fulfill its true regalian functions of being able to be the sole reference point for restoring institutions, the social and political institutions in our country. Naturally, we realize that the success of this agreement is going to be heavily dependent on the support from our partners. And amongst these partners, I certainly count on the, American, the United States and USIP. As you know, when, in order to get to the signing of the agreement, we had to pool our efforts. We had to work together at, in order to overcome all the obstacles by, and also taking into account the demands of the citizens of Central African Republic. However, we are far from being finished in this work because the most important step, of course, will be implementation, and this will require ongoing negotiation. The government 
has not yet been able to develop all of its capacities to conduct this mission alone. So I am here to also advocate uh, that all of our partners help us and we mobilize partners to help us to be able to attain these objectives through concrete action. Through your illustrious institute, I hope to see that you will continue to maintain and even step up your support in several specific areas, particularly uh, support for our overall strategy for communication so that appropriate messages are being conveyed to the population. And that we can also uh, ensure that there is buy-in and ownership for this peace agreement, which is so necessary for its implementation. International actors uh, can also help us with transformational leadership, developing projects to promote peace and cult the peace of culture of peace and human rights protections, protecting human rights at every level of society, uh, especially for the young people, uh, those who are in school, those who are not in school, and all segments of society. These will be important actions. And during our discussions uh, earlier, we I'm sure that during the Q&A after, we will perhaps talk more at length about some of the actions that we can take to help promote peace and reconciliation in my country. I know that I can count on your assistance. I know that you have heard my call and my appeal, and we are very willing to work with you to have your support so that our peace can be a success story and can be a shared story with many. Thank you. Monsieur le Président, uh, and uh, let me let me also welcome to the stage uh, Ambassador Johnny Carson. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Ambassador Carson, many of you know, former assistant former assistant secretary um, of uh, uh, of Africa at the State Department, uh, served as ambassador in Zimbabwe, Uganda and Kenya, most importantly as a senior advisor here at U.S. Institute of Peace. So Ambassador Carson, Ambassador Tamlin, uh, welcome to the stage. And um, thank you for those. Ah, there we go. Thank you for those, thank you for those very um, far-reaching and insightful comments. Um, I want to pick up at one of the comments you made towards the end, which is uh, the importance of communicating to, to the citizens of Central Africa Republic. Uh, there have been seven previous peace agreements since 2013. This is the eighth. How are you communicating to them that this is different? Uh, and what has been the reaction thus far, and what else do you need to help with that important part of the implementation of the peace agreement? If I could start with you, President Tordera. Thank you very much. This is one of the challenges uh, for successful implementation of the agreement. Because if the commitments that we have undertaken are not well understood by our citizens, then it will be very difficult to actually implement them. But one thing is certain, this agreement, we, we may think that this is just one more agreement in a succession of others, but I can tell you that this agreement, for us, this is not a fatality. Rather, this agreement, we believe, will be the last agreement if we are all 
strongly committed and determined to ensure its implementation. This agreement has something more than the other agreements because all the different uh, stakeholders and protagonists took the necessary time to discuss all the different issues and all the points that are included in the agreement. First of all, they've been discussing and negotiating this for three years since I took office. The armed groups have been, the 14 armed groups have been discussing this for three years. So we've been creating the conditions to ensure that we can uh, implement the DDR process, which was uh, recommended by the Bangi, Bangi Forum. So we've, dis we've started these discussions with the 14 armed groups. Unfortunately, uh, it, not all of them followed through. Eleven of them are on board, but not the other three. There have been several attempts uh, through different African heads of states, through the AU, but we did agree with all the different partners that we had to merge all these initiatives. In Brussels, we had a meeting where all those who wanted to participate, who wanted to help CAR to restore stability and peace, uh, met and we agreed to uh, promote an initiative to have a have this discussion, this initiative under the aegis of the African Union. So a panel of facilitators was established in Libreville. And this panel has begun its work. Uh, this was in 2017. The panel has met with the 14 different armed groups in their regions at their bases and the discussions have discussions have been held with the leaders of these armed groups but also with the different combatants from these groups. So the discussions have already started at this level with the 14 armed groups. Now each armed group has produced a written document with its demands, uh, the demands that they wish to have in place in order to move towards peace. Now the uh, different uh, demands were very were different from group to group, so the panel has tried to harmonize them. And so a meeting was held amongst the armed groups to harmonize their political demands. And they were able to produce 120 demands, which were then submitted to the government. We then provided a, a response uh, within the parameters that I already discussed, respect of constitu respecting the Constitution, territorial integrity, uh, respecting institutions, and saying no to impunity. Those were the parameters we established. And so in Khartoum, we had discussions. And we discussed point by point the various elements of the agreement. We went through point by point, word by word. All the different protagonists, all the different parties are well aware of the commitments that have been made. Now, it's true that there were very difficult moments uh, during these negotiations, uh, particularly around the issue of impunity or the issue of amnesty and also power sharing. But I believe that in, if everybody respects the parameters, all the, co all the parties have realized that we cannot move towards peace if we uh, do not deal with the issues of justice. So everybody is fully aware of this necessity and they everybody realizes that all the provisions of this agreement have been agreed to by all the parties and it's been signed. However, it's not just the parties, it's also the facilitators. This agreement uh, has been, almost all the neighboring countries are guarantors of this agreement. The international community. Uh, friendly countries, our allies, are supporting this agreement. We have the United Nations, France, the U.S. All these ally countries are helping to support the agreement, and they have uh, clearly stated their, their support for the agreement. So we're counting on all of our partners to help us implement the agreement. Of course, there will be challenges. For example, I, I was mentioning earlier that in the provisions of this agreement, 
according to these uh, the agreement, the government has to uh, take 21 commitments. The armed groups have only 10 commitments. So we've started uh, fulfilling these commitments. The first one, uh, the most important, is Article 21 of the agreement, which stipulates that as soon as the uh, agreement is signed, an inclusive government is to be established. This is what we tried to do on March 30th. Um, and even before that, there was an inclusive government in place. But some of the armed groups have felt that they are not as well represented in this inclusive government or they don't have enough representation. And so they have brought the matter to the, the panel of facilitators. There was a meeting in Addis Ababa between a government team and the a team of the, part, the armed groups. And I believe they were, reached a compromise. And after that, we were able to set up an inclusive government on March 22nd. And the uh, first, the prime minister has been here, and members of the government are in place. So, but there are still challenges. The agreement is not going to happen from one day to the next. There are major challenges. One of the, and this is one of the challenges. What you mentioned, the problem of communication, because we can't forget that we are uh, working in a political context where some of the political actors think that they should rather take this opportunity to continue to disrupt the situation. People who are enemies of peace are not going to allow things to go about without uh, any problems. There are some elements. Some of our fellow citizens who are actually working against this agreement. And so we have to continue explaining to the populace. We have to explain that we have no other choice but to move towards peace and dialogue. And I am firmly committed. I have committed the government to work uh, to uh, further implement the peace agreement. And, and this is a very strong resolute, uh, resolute determination that we've undertaken. Uh, we have to implement this agreement even with the challenges that we have. And we have to uh, find additional resources to do this. And these are resources that we perhaps lack. And so we're continuing to discuss with our friends, uh, uh, such as Europe, the World Bank, and others, to continue supporting us with implementation of the agreement. And of course, communication uh, has to also be in line with the population's expectations for this agreement, because they expect to see dividends from the peace. And this agreement that we signed, they have to see in reality that there are concrete actions on the ground being taken that will be helping, for example, displaced persons to help them find homes again uh, or help them live in better conditions, to have access to basic social services, hospitals, uh, to be able to send their children back to school, uh, to be able to go back to work, to sell their products in the markets as quickly as possible. So these are all the challenges that we will have to overcome in addition to communication uh, in order to really give this uh, an agreement a good uh, fighting chance. Sorry if I was a little bit long in my response. You've, you've given us a glimpse of some of the complexities and some of the very intricate, long process that it takes to get to peace. I want to pull on one of the issues that you uh, refer to, and that is the classic problem in a peace agreement of balancing amnesty with demands for justice. And you quite rightly noted the insistence on no impunity, but there's often some gray areas between amnesty and justice. And if you'd, I'd like to turn to Ambassador Carson. Um, if you could give us from your long experience in working these issues, how you've seen that balance between accountability, impunity, you know, solving the conflict and creating an inclusive government with citizen demands for justice. Let me first of all uh, say to uh, President Watar, welcome uh, to USIP and congratulations to you and your colleagues on the um, enormous uh, amount of work that you have done uh, over the last several years and certainly over the last several months uh, to uh, help uh, restore uh, peace and stability uh, to your country. The challenges are enormous, and clearly the greatest uh, challenge that you face is the one that President Lindbergh uh, mentioned, and that is trying to balance uh, peace uh, and justice. 
Uh, I would say uh, to you, based on the comments in, in your uh, speech, that it is uh, important, absolutely important, uh, that those who are responsible uh, for uh, carrying out so much of the violence not hold the peace process to hostage. And therefore, it is absolutely essential uh, to carry out uh, the outlines uh, of the uh, effort that you have underway uh, in the February agreement. Uh, the Inclusivity uh, Commission must, in fact, uh, do uh, its work and must do it rapidly. It must identify all of the drivers of conflict and clearly point them out. The Truth, uh, Reconciliation, uh, and Justice Commission should, in fact, uh, be established as quickly as possible, and that uh, it should be a commission that hears the voice uh, of the people who participated uh, in uh, the 2015 uh, Bangui uh, Forum on National Reconciliation. If, for me, there was one major shortcoming in the February uh, agreement, uh, it is, in fact, uh, that not enough of the voices of victims were heard. The voices of civil society, the voices of the women uh, and young children uh, who were the victims of the violence, the men and women who were the victims uh, of the violence. And here again, coming back to the element of communication, uh, it is important uh, to hear the voices uh, of the uh, people. Uh, creating uh, peace and sustaining that peace is not uh, a zero-sum uh, game. And in fact, uh, those who commit the violence must at some point uh, be brought uh, to justice. But they must be brought to justice in a transparent fashion. They must be brought to justice in a fashion in which the people of the country who have been the victims of the violence are satisfied with the outcome as well. And if I can interject with a question from our audience, for, for any of the three of you, so what degree do you think economic crimes like corruption should be incorporated into this truth and reconciliation and transitional justice process? So, John, you mentioned the violence. There's also the economic aspect of what's gone on the last, since 2013. If I can, Mr. President, I would say absolutely. Uh, one of the drivers uh, of the uh, conflict uh, in the Central African Republic has been uh, the uh, enormous uh, predation and theft uh, of the country's uh, economic uh, resources, uh, its, uh, its diamonds, its gold, uh, its cobalt, uh, and also uh, the loss uh, uh, and theft of, of animals and livestock. Uh, those individuals who are responsible for those economic crimes should also be brought uh, to justice because their theft has not only undermined the integrity, the economic strength of the nation, it has also undermined the integrity of villages, uh, communities, families, uh, and individuals. And their actions uh, should, in fact, be brought uh, before the courts uh, as well. Uh, impunity, whether it is impunity for killing a person or, 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 or stealing the resources of the country, uh, should not be tolerated. President Tordar, you mentioned this in your comments. Uh, Ambassador Carson just touched on this. 20% um, of the population is displaced from this bloody conflict, um, both as refugees and inside Central Africa Republic, um, with a lot of repercussions. Livelihoods gone, property taken by others. Uh, these are all of the s problems that attend a reconciliation process. Do, uh, as a part of this peace plan, are there specific plans targeting th these one million people who are displaced? Hey. 
Yes, of course. Uh, of course, this will be part of some of the urgent actions that we will need to take uh, within the context of the agreement. But let me first of all just react to something that was said. In this agreement, we have certain timelines, as you were saying. The Inclusive Commission needs to be able to do its work quickly. We do have some deadlines. We had established a deadline of about 100 and, or 90 days, rather. This is set in the uh, agreement that the uh, Inclusive Commission would have 90 days to identify the different cases and the crimes and to submit its report to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which is supposed to then be operational 90 days following the agreement. So uh, we are trying to move as quickly as possible to tackle this problem of justice. And as you said, it's not just uh, crimes of violence. There are also economic crimes that have to be punished. There, there's no such thing as just a small crime. It, these crimes must also be brought before the appropriate judicial bodies. And this is not a justice that is a uh, justice based on vengeance or revenge. This has to be true justice that is uh, fair and that introduces peace. And this is what we are attempting to implement through the special criminal court that we've established, through the justice, Truth, Justice, and, and uh, Reconciliation Commission, and also through other judicial bodies uh, that have the competence and the, the necessary qualifications to fairly try and judge these cases. Uh, and we have received support from some of our partners, including the United States, uh, to revitalize our judicial system. Some of our partners, such as the EU, uh, are working with us to help build the capacities of our formal judicial system so that they can carry out this mission, uh, in addition to the Truth, Justice, and Reconciliation Commission. Of course, today, about 20% of our population has been affected by this crisis. Many of our citizens have been displaced, either internally, uh, even within their own villages. They're, they've been displaced because they've been forced to move to places where they're, there's greater security. Uh, and they can't necessarily come back to their daily lives or their activities. And in our country, as you may know, a large portion of our population uh, lives off agriculture. Uh, and But since there are armed groups everywhere, these people can't necessarily go out to work in the fields. And they become more fragile. And they can't, uh, they can't meet the needs of their families because they can't go out and work and do their daily activities. So this is an enormous problem. So we have to find solutions for these issues and for the people. Uh, because the people really want to be able to go back to work, they want peace, and they want to be able to resume their normal lives. This is why, for us, it's a priority. Good. So for us, it is a priority that violence stop, that these people be able to to their occupations. There are people who, even in their own village, cannot go two, three kilometers to perform their activities. So for us, we need to have a rapid response for these populations. We need to help them from a humanitarian standpoint. We must uh, help them from um, health uh, point of view, give them potable water. And for children who haven't gone to school for quite a while, they have to go back to school. So all these activities uh, that in this context, we have a strong expectation from the population. So this is urgent. So the support from uh, some of our friends in this area uh, will help us speed this up. We have a recovery program that is being financed. I just came back from Brussels a month ago to talk about the conditions uh, for resetting our, our priorities on this. Uh, because it, it, there is a strong expectation from the population. We signed the agreement, and the population wants dividends. And that means finding peace once again. And it's an urgent question that requires financing, support, uh, both in terms of skills, know-how, uh, etc. 
you know, you, you point to a classic problem where there are so many needs, they're so urgent, uh, you have both humanitarian life-saving needs as well as the longer-term reconstruction needs. A, a question both to build on what you just said and also to invite Ambassador Tamlin in. How, how do you see the international community uh, helping to balance the humanitarian with the longer term? Um, has the government provided priorities of how to provide that balance? But it's, it's both managing expectations and prioritizing when everything needs urgent attention. Ambassador Tamlin, do you want to jump in on that? Thank you, and I think you've really hit the nail on the head. That is the challenge that the friends and partners of the Central African Republic are dealing with on a daily basis. There are actually a couple of innovative mechanisms that are in place to address this. Um, the European Union, for example, has a fund called the Fonds Becou, which is specifically designed to have flexibility to be able to support a continuum of activities that go from humanitarian to development. and. Um, they are big bureaucracy, like, <laughs> like ours, but Fonds Becou has been set up specifically to try to be more agile and also to be able to serve as a kind of a multi-donor <coughs> trust fund so that other non-EU members are invited to contribute. So that, that is one mechanism. Uh, speaking for the part of the U.S. government, we are primarily um, right now focused on humanitarian assistance. But our humanitarian assistance does not rule out the possibility of supporting displaced persons returning and helping them resume their livelihoods. And this is a little bit about what the president was speaking of in terms of being able to meet that peace dividend once displaced persons are able to return home, which as he pointed out in some cases is just going across town, but across town and feeling safe. And, 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 and secure knowing that you will be able to move back to your home and go back to your fields. So we hope to be able to, when the conditions permit, to help support these kinds of returns as long as they are obviously done consistent with international norms for security and, uh, and the well-being of the people concerned. I do have to say that our longer-term projects, which we're working on, which are primarily focused on supporting the justice and security sectors, uh, are also laying the seeds for that longer-term development. It's about institution building. And part of the, 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 the peace agreement's objective is to allow the institutions of government to be reestablished, to move out into areas that haven't known government institutions for many years. And we're particularly proud of what we're doing in the justice and security sectors because we have identified those as key. You're right, in a sea of need, where do you start? But we decided to start with justice and security. And so with our assistance, we are training police, we're training gendarmes, we're helping to rehabilitate uh, courthouses and police stations, providing equipment, communications equipment, transportation equipment, uniforms, and providing a lot of training also to help these actors understand that they are the servants of the people. So we're, we're doing our part, but it is, it is a challenge, and I think that USIP is actually an organization which can help us try to understand what are some of the, how do you actually work your way through those priorities and how do you identify how to be most transformational in terms of assisting a country with the depth of needs of, of CAR. Thank you. Thank you. You know, certainly security is always paramount uh, and a citizen having a sense of security. And uh, Your Excellency, you noted in your comments that this wasn't fundamentally a Christian Muslim conflict, but those rumors certainly fanned the flames of it becoming so. So have, 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 has the peace process moved so that those tensions are calmed now? Are there fewer tensions? Are people feeling more secure in their neighborhoods, um, enabling people to feel like they can go home? Thank you. At the time of this crisis, we, it, there was a desire to say that this was a religious conflict between uh, Christians and Muslims, but that's really a caricature. 
because the Central African people have never had this experience. Uh, in our history, we've never had this kind of situation. Our communities uh, lived together peacefully. And so it's uh, some people under this crisis perhaps had political gains or strengthened their strategic positions. Uh, and by uh, fanned the flames of this crisis to do so. Uh, to, but I really believe that fundamentally the Central African people is not for this type of, of consideration. Uh, the proof is that when in areas where today there is peace, uh, the communities live, live peacefully together. So we have to work. I mean, we can't just forget about it, obviously, but there are a certain number of parasites who have found power through this and through communication, uh, awareness raising, we have to inform our population, our people, that this is not a good way of looking at the crisis that we live through. And so that requires work, uh, work between communities and at all levels uh, by institutions like yours. Uh, religious actors, uh, religious leaders. Uh, in my country, there was a there was a platform created of religious leaders, and that really helped to to get rid of this qualification of of the crisis uh, as a religious conflict, because the religious leaders uh, did not see it this way. They got together uh, to denounce this situation and that really slowed or at least uh, or, or even eliminated the efforts of the people who wanted us to fall in, in this catastrophic situation. But we have to continue to do this because f we have to continue this work because some people we have to remove this from the consciousness of our population uh, because I think if we have peace, if we have proper communication, people will go back in the right direction. Um, people are still in a precarious situation at this point. Uh, they can't resume their occupations quite yet. So we, uh, it is an ongoing problem, but from our point of view, I, I think it's a f it's a problem we can fix pretty easily, because this is not uh, how we see things. About how you see the integration of former armed group members happening, this is again a part of the fundamental security and reconciliation process. You mentioned 11 of the 14 armed groups have signed up. What do you see as the process of integrating them? This is a question from the audience. Um. There are several types of integration. Uh, first, integration within the National Army. Uh, there were people who were Parts, part of these armed groups, and at a given point, they even doubted the government's will to want to integrate them in the army. I want to recall that a lot of our young people who joined up, the, who joined these armed groups, they didn't do it because they shared their convictions. They did because they were looking for job opportunities. They went because they thought, well, there's a rebellion and maybe it, they will get power and I will have a job. And eventually they realized that wasn't the case. So these are people who are now ready to serve their country in the correct manner. We have tested some things. I, I decided that we could test this integration, a pilot DDR program, if you will, uh, at this scale, at a reduced scale, um, by armed groups. So, and now some people from these armed groups have reintegrated into the national army, and they're working. They're under our flag. They have missions like all other 
<coughs> the soldiers and it's working. Uh, so in this case, I really don't think it's there is a, an integration problem. Uh, obviously, not everyone is going to join the army. There are rules, principles, uh, standards that are going to be established. Uh, there's uh, there's age. Uh, those who don't have a legal um, illegal antecedents. There are criteria to join uh, the army. You don't just join up. Uh, you have to meet these criteria. <clears throat> and these uh, were established by the EUTM, by the MINUSCA. And that those who cannot join the army because they don't meet these criteria, or who don't want to, um, there are other activities. Uh, they, we can put them in training programs, in uh, programs to um, reintegrate them into society through small jobs, being a, a, mason, a bricklayer uh, in agriculture, etc., to bring them back into the work life. And then there are those who are former soldiers and who joined the rebels. There is a commission that has been set up to handle those cases, uh, former soldiers who joined uh, armed groups. There is a commission within the army and it acts uh, within the framework of the agreement uh, in, with the EUTM and with the MINUSCA, and it, it examines everything case per case for individuals, and it looks at what rank they were at in the armed groups. So there are stages, there are uh, provisions to be applied to each category, and none of these armed groups uh, will be left behind or forgotten. Every case will be examined uh, with the support of this process. And I, I, we've had good tests on this. So one of the aspects of your question is, is disintegration, uh, does the population approve of disintegration? Well, that's a question of communication. Uh, it doesn't mean that those who are integrated are forgiven from um, justice. Justice must do its work. We have to say no to impunity, and that is clearly stated in the agreement. So the, those in charge of the 14 groups uh, were fully aware of this when they signed. So we want to say that we're not going to abandon the victims or the, or the, the rights of the victims. The, the Constitution of the Republic, as I said, which is it's preserved within the framework of this agreement, is, says no to impunity. The form of Bangui, uh, which is basically the foundation of our last Constitution, and it is the people, to answer another question, the victims have not been forgotten. Uh, we had the Bangui Forum in 2015, where, which was based on consultation, meaning the organizers asked questions from our people throughout the entire country to understand their positions regarding each subject and regarding amnesty, regarding peace. And they said no to amnesty. And this no to amnesty is included within the Constitution, and it is respected within the framework of this agreement. ...from the audience to this is that many of the rebel groups, of course, profited from the conflict. Um, they made a lot of money uh, because the conflict was going on. Does the peace agreement address what is a fundamental disincentive for these groups to make peace? And in particular, will the peace agreement enable the government to stop the illegal exploitation of diamonds, which has been one important source of revenue for the armed groups? The person who asked this question was, was Right, uh, yes, it is a, a challenge because uh, uh, for the implementation of this agreement. Now, the demands of the armed groups, 
uh, within those. Since I took office, we have worked on a certain number of items because the, group, the armed groups thought that their regions were not sufficiently um, taken into account, let's say, by the government and they, that they were not properly represented in government bodies and that uh, the regions they were from did not uh, have enough development projects, uh, programs, etc. It's not true given our context, but we have to provide answers. That's why I um, engaged the government with our partners into this difference positive as, as I uh, positive difference, as I call it, uh, to create development programs in these regions uh, to reassure our fellow citizens who are out in these regions that they still belong to the Republic. But uh, political questions, we don't hear too much about it. Um, but now it is, uh, the, the conflicts we have seen among armed groups over the past three years, it's really conflicts among them for the occupation of mining areas because they want to be the owners to, to use these mining areas. It's predation. They're, they're predators, essentially. And they're also fighting on the transhumans pass uh, where we move cattle from one area to another because they are making money from that. And that is how they buy their weapons and continue to operate. Now, if we want to move towards peace, for some of the leaders of these armed groups, it's it's going to mean less revenue. So it's it's so it is important that we have the support of all the international community, our partners, the MINUSCA. Article 35, for example, uh, stipulates sanctions and, and must push us towards peace. We feel good about it because we feel that most of the people within these armed groups are, are not getting their interests taken care of. They are used, they're being used and they know it. Since the crisis began, uh, they didn't see any increase in their income, any change in their life. Uh, so, you know, those people, they. And the groups that say, we're from this region, they haven't invested anything in these regions. The people from these regions know it's, uh, they haven't done anything. So everyone is committed to peace now. But there are those who have their own interests and who are going to fight against this, and others who have political interests uh, that, and they're going to work against it. But the majority of the population, the majority of the armed groups want to work for peace. Encouraging words. And of course, there are interests not only inside the country, but outside the country. You live in a tough neighborhood. And I want to ask both ambassadors, Carson and Tamlin, if you could comment on what do you see as some of the factors regionally that could lead to stability or could lead to instability? And how can international partners help assist with some of these neighborhood dynamics? And, and there's a particular card question uh, asking about the role of Chad. So you can wrap that in. Hi. Start first. Let me uh, say that it is an extraordinarily tough region, but this is indeed a historic moment uh, in the political life of the CAR. Uh, your peace agreement of February uh, and your government uh, under your leadership have given uh, hope to uh, a lot of people in your country as well as a number of important countries in the international community. It is, I think, absolutely critical to continue uh, the progress that, uh, that you are making uh, in order to maintain uh, the support uh, from the international community, starting with the United Nations and its peacekeeping office, the European Union, the United States, France, and others who are engaged uh, in this process. 
I think it's also uh, critical, uh, too, to continue to win the support of the uh, World Bank uh, and the uh, IMF. And your progress uh, will incentivize those in the international community to help as well. Uh, you are, however, uh, in a very, very tough neighborhood. Uh, you're surrounded uh, by six countries, five of which are engaged in internal civil strife uh, and conflict. Uh, some of that conflict uh, moves across uh, the border uh, and has the capacity to undermine your stability. I think it's absolutely critical that you continue your regional diplomacy, you continue your Africa diplomacy, and that you, in fact, move out beyond that to look uh, for some uh, of the stronger and more forceful political uh, and strategic African voices to join in and help you push forward. Uh, some of your more immediate neighbors uh, can, in fact, be more troublesome than helpful. What you need to do is to find those who are a little bit further away who can be more helpful than troublesome. Did you want to add on, Ambassador Tim? Thank you. Um, I wanted to second what Ambassador Carson has said. And, and certainly in our American diplomacy, one of the things that I've committed to President Tuadera is that we would work regionally to support the peace agreement, not just bilaterally. So that's, that's something that, we, that we've undertaken because we recognize that the solution is a regional solution. But I also wanted to mention one thing. You talked about trends in the region and, and events. And one of the things that the President has mentioned a couple of times in the meetings that we've had with different um, groups over the last two days is the importance of regulating transhumance, which is the seasonal movement of livestock and humans. And I, I think it's something that people have been aware of for a long time, but it's starting to become um, more obvious that this is a, a source of conflict, but it's also a source of great wealth. And well managed, it can produce harmonious relationships between countries who live in zones where the, the livestock need to travel out in search of pastures during the, the dry season, and zones which have the, the, the rich and lush vegetation such as the Central African Republic and can provide that, 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 that um, de destination point for transhumance. So transhumance is something that must be ultimately managed at the local level. It's about agreements between villages and the people moving through them. Um, but it's an important role of the state to also provide the framework to make it clear that, that they will back up those local level agreements. And I think that one of the important aspects of the agreement, which the President has mentioned, is setting up mixed commissions to work with neighboring countries to try to resolve some of those border issues. So I think that's a very promising, very important aspect of the agreement. Thank you. Um, and moving from the regional to the international, there are several questions here. Um, asking about the considerable attention to the growing role of Russia in CAR and a concern that some of Russia's actions are not contributing to peace um, and whether uh, you see ways to ensure that all partners, re including Russia, uh, are able to be positive forces for peace. Do you want to comment on that, Mr. President? Yes. <laughs> well, there are no uh, subjects that are off the table as far as I'm concerned. There's a role for everybody in Central Africa. In terms of economic activities, for example, mining. We have a mining code which clearly stipulates how a company can set up and start doing business in Central African Republic. And this is a market that has been liberalized. All the different actors, all the investors uh, can, if they fulfill, if they meet these criteria and these conditions, can come and work uh, in full transparency in, in CAR. It's not a matter of influence. It's rather an issue of investment. The mining code is very clear, just as the forestry code, the business code, they all function. And moreover, with the mining code, we have provisions, legislative provisions, uh, that under the Constitution in Article 60, 
stipulate that any party that wants to invest has to uh, receive uh, authorization from the National Assembly so that we can ensure that these companies actually fulfill the criteria. Uh, in the mining areas, we have African partners, Chinese partners, we've got Russian partners, French partners, everybody's there. And when we came here to Washington, we're also coming to invite American investors, American business people to come and invest and work in Central African Republic, just like all the others. This will help us to uh, uh, find solutions and help provide more solutions to our crisis because, as I was saying earlier, our young people today, uh, many of them joined these armed groups simply because they were seeking employment. They, they didn't, uh, it wasn't because of the vision or the ideology. So if we have more investors who come in and, and employ them, well, then they'll have a future to look forward to. And this will prevent them from taking up arms or uh, going to these armed groups or other activities. Uh, that's one of the objectives, too. We want to create the cl the, a good investment climate to attract investment to CAR. Also, there's the military aspect and security. The Russian Federation has sent Russian trainers, and this is not something that was done in secret. This was actually th done through the UN Sanctions Committee, which knew was aware of this, and it was thanks to this effort that uh, uh, the Russian Federation was authorized to provide support to us uh, for uh, training and also for equipping the mil uh, our army with weapons. But it, this is because we have a great need. We have, uh, there's a demand. It's not an ideological uh, reason that's leading us to work with Russia. And we are asking all of our partners to support us, to help us to rebuild our army and to support us in this effort. Uh, the ambassador was just saying that the United States uh, is providing support with logistics. And also, right now, uh, some studies are being undertaken to see how the U.S. can provide more support for the Army and CAR. So we're asking all of our friends to support us. We're facing major challenges. Central African Republic, it's not a problem with the Crimea or these types of issues. We are, we, it's not really a strategic issue. It's, it's, it's an urgent need in a country like Africa in this context in a country in Africa in this context, uh, even if intellectually we can talk about it or we can talk about it on a political level, but we have the urgent need and the most urgent need, and that is that our people are suffering and they need peace and stability. We need an army to ensure peace and, and we need the support of our friends, including the United States. So we're running out of time, but I want to give each of you to quickly share with all of us. Uh, we're, we'll start with you, Ambassador, and, and just move down the line. What, we're at a pivotal moment. We've all noted that. What gives you the greatest hope? Uh, the, the young people of the Central African Republic that I've met who are eager to take their place in, in society to help their country move forward. It's a great source of inspiration. Thanks. Ambassador Carson. Uh, the current leadership, uh, the president uh, and his team, uh, his commitment uh, and uh, his actions thus far, and the hope that he will fulfill the commitments uh, of the February Accord, ensuring uh, that uh, it is justice uh, that prevails along with peace. No, I would like to first of all sincerely thank you for giving me this opportunity to come to USIP and for everything that you've done for us, even if you've done it uh, discreetly or on this side, but everything you've done to support us and to help us to achieve stability for our population. So I'd like to thank you and also thank everybody here uh, and the, everybody who came today in the audience for the very interesting questions that were raised. Uh, I hope we've been able to shed light on a certain number of aspects, but we are very determined and committed to restoring peace in our country, and we're committed to implement this agreement, which for us is an opportunity, a great opportunity for the people of Central African Republic, and we need your support. Thank you. It's very difficult to climb out of decades of conflict, 
and you've given us reason to be very hopeful that this is the opportunity for the Central Africa Republic to truly move into a new era of peace. I want to thank you for coming with your vision, with your very candid uh, responses, obviously very knowledgeable. Leadership matters in these situations. Um, and your emphasis on, on justice, on accountability, on communication, and on meeting the needs of your people will obviously be critical elements as we move forward. Thank you. I know you'll keep us posted on how all of us and many in the room who have long, long been supporters of CAR, how we can continue to support you and the people of CAR during this very, very important period. Um, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, everybody, for being here for your continued interest uh, in CAR's journey towards peace. And please join me once again in thanking President Twardar, Ambassador Carson, Ambassador Tamler. Um, if I could ask everybody to please remain in your seats uh, while the official delegation exits. It'll just be one moment.